Good. So welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to our Friday noon seminar. Uh, today we have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Emily McWalter. She's an assistant professor of mechanical engineering and biomedical engineering at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. And I will let her talk to us today. I will let her. I'm happy to introduce her today to talk to us about quantitative MRI in the loaded knee. So go ahead, uh, Emily. Thank you very much for the introduction and, and thanks for having me. Um, it's, we, don't, we don't have a big imaging group in, in Saskatoon and so we don't really have a weekly seminar, but in my former lives we had this kind of thing, so it's nice to participate. I'll start with a land acknowledgement. So I'd like to acknowledge that as we gather here today, um, I, that I live and work on Treaty 6 territory, the ha homeland of the Métis. We re pay respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationships with one another. Okay. All right, so I thought I'd kind of tell you a little bit about who I am first. <laughs> so I'm a mechanical engineer by training. Um, I did my undergraduate degree at Queen's University. Um, so just down the road from where you are and maybe a tiny rivalry. I don't know if that still exists, but maybe a little bit. Um, at the time, I was really interested in biomechanics and aeronautics, but I graduated in 2002. So we'd had the dot-com um, bubble burst and the aeronautics industry was not doing well. So I ended up in a, a master's degree in biomechanics um, at the University of British Columbia. I then stayed there for my PhD. And I'd say at that time I was more an MRI user uh, than, had, than having much knowledge in the area of imaging. So I used images, I did image processing, but didn't know much about MRI at the time. So it became an interest though during my, my graduate training. So I ended up doing, going to Stanford um, and worked in the radiological sciences lab there to really kind of start learning the MR physics and more about how MRI works. And that's where my interest in um, quantitative MRI really started to develop. And then um, I didn't leave my, my mechanics behind. So this little icon here is just denoting um, a, a, a tissue uh, mechanical testing device. So I kept that kind of work there as well. Um, following my five years there, I started a, a, a job as an assistant professor in mechanical engineering. Um, I do have cross appointments in biomedical engineering and uh, medical imaging at the university as well. And I've really kind of continued this work of uh, bulking up the mechanical side of my research as well as continuing with the quantitative MR. And the focus of my research has really been in the knee, the two different joints in the knee my whole life. So patellofemoral joint and the tibiofemoral joint. So I often just give a little blurb about the University of Saskatchewan because before I came here, I must admit, I didn't know anything about Saskatchewan. I'd only I'd never been to Saskatchewan. I'd never been to Saskatoon. So we are located in Saskatoon, not Regina. Um, so the University of Saskatchewan is in Saskatoon. We're quite a large university with 26,000 students. We do have a medical school. Uh, another highlight of the university is we have the Canadian light source, which is a synchrotron. It's the only one in Canada. So we have some great physicists here working on that and get to do tours and sometimes participate in some beamline studies. So that's been fun since being here. Um, other strengths of our university include the vet college, um, our college of agriculture and our institutes of water and food security. One challenge that I encounter here, though, is that we don't have a dedicated M MRI for research. Um, I have to try and squeeze my research in on the clinical magnets. Um, there's some kind of plan there's plans that in the works on this, but you believe it when you see it, right? But so that's one challenge in working at a place like the University of Saskatchewan when you're really, especially post COVID, the clinical backlogs and staffing at the MR are really barrier to getting work done. So I'll show you today what, where I've got to in my time here. Um, and I'll step back and say the overarching research um, goal of my, my program is that to effectively treat osteoarthritis, um, we must correct mechanics at the joint and tissue level. So that's where that links back into my talk today on loading like quantitative MRI in the loaded knee. Um, but really, my applications are in the realm of osteoarthritis 
and trying to understand what's going on at both the joint and tissue level and like ultimately trying to correct this. So I, I'm quite early down this path, but kind of wanted to give a broader look on why I'm doing the work that I do. So what is osteoarthritis? Um, it's a disease of the whole joint. So it involves not just bone, but also bone cartilage, meniscus, tendons, ligaments, muscles, um, all inflammation, so like synovitis, effusion, all those things are involved with osteoarthritis. It causes pain, stiffness, and loss of mobility, and it suffers, and it affects 13% of Canadians. So it's a huge financial burden in direct and indirect cost in the country, especially with um, limiting work of its sufferers. So we, we affect our workforce quite a bit. There's really kind of two main forms of the disease. One is post-traumatic. So say you have a knee injury, like an ACL injury or meniscal tear, you're more likely to get osteoarthritis. So about 50% of individuals who've had a knee injury develop osteoarthritis about after about 15 years. So that can be a relatively young person. Like we often think of it as the idiopathic form of the, degree of the disease, which is kind of more aging based and kind of just happens over time and that's our older cohort that we tend to think more about but this post-traumatic cohort these young people who could be in their 20s and 30s starting to show signs of osteoarthritis is also a really important group to study and unfortunately for these individuals there is no known cure now my approach to this is using quantitative MRI. I really like it as um, a, a tool to study osteoarthritis because it's non-invasive. Um, we can do the quantitative work. As you all know, quantitative MRI, MRI is more than a picture. We can get quantitative values from it. And there are several quantitative metrics that have been shown to be useful in in studying osteoarthritis. So T2 relaxation times, T1 row, something called the GEMRIC where you use a contrast agent, um, diffusion, uh, UTE has been very popular. So that's a, a, a like T2 star mapping with UTE rather. So there's been lots of um, work going on in this area because it really seems to be a promising tool to non-invasively study the knee. Um, I'm using T2, T2 as an example here, um, just to show you why the quantitative metrics are becoming uh, a point of interest in osteoarthritis research more and more um, over time. And it's because our metrics actually do seem to be telling us something about the tissue composition itself. So T2 relaxation times um, show strong correlations with collagen organization in the tissue. Um, moderate to strong correla correlations with the water content in the, in the tissue. And it's also been shown to increase in individuals with osteoarthritis. So these ideas together make it a, a really nice tool. And like I said, I just use T2 as, as an example. We have similar types of data with other quantitative MR metrics. Um, my talk today will focus more on T2. So again, that's why I used it as an example, but I'm by no means discarding the other great metrics. Now, extending that idea a bit, we mostly image our knees when we're lying, when participants are lying down and, are, and their legs are just in a relaxed position, but this is not how we use our joints. So we're not imaging in a functional way. Um, so I know functional MRI has kind of been taken by the brain imagers, um, but we can also think of functional MRI as imaging a loaded, joint right that that's how that we're imaging the joint in a functional position um and what t2 relaxation times have actually shown in the loaded joint is that that they decrease with load and this is likely because of our um our relationships with the structure of the tissues and the content of the tissues okay so now this is i'm going to I've given you like a brief overview of, of the field and why I use the tools I do. Um, I'm going to dig into what we're, I'm going to talk about today. So overall, I'll talk about the different considerations for imaging MRI in the loaded knee. So why do we want to do this? And, and, and then how do we do this? So I, I'm going to talk about some of the loading rigs that our group has designed and constructed and used in the MRI, both 
in vivo and living humans and ex vivo and cadavers. And then I'll talk about the MR sequences that we use, um, as well as the image processing techniques. Um, and then finally, I'll end off with giving you just a tiny um, kind of snapshot of some of the data we've got in our group and some of the themes that we're seeing coming out of these data. And then at the very end, I'll talk about a collaboration I have with one of your, your esteemed colleagues at McGill, because I couldn't leave that out. So let's let's talk about why should we image the loaded knee. So uh, this is a, just a, a view of your knee, and we know it's composed of all different tissues. Um, today, I'm really going to focus on articular cartilage and the meniscus. What are the roles of these tissues of the knee? Well, when we load our knee, their job is to transmit loads through the joint. So if we're just imaging them in an unloaded position, we're not seeing them doing their jobs. Um, the tissues themselves are highly organized. So I have a, just a picture of cartilage here to give you an idea. It's um, 80, 68 to 85% water, 10 to 20% collagen, and then a small amount of proteal glycan. But it's really the organization we need to look at. So at the superficial zone, we have really tangentially oriented collagen. Through the middle, it's a bit more random. And then in the deep zone, we call it quite radial. Similarly for the meniscus, this is a really interesting tissue. So um, in its cross section, it is um, triangular, but on top of the knee, it's a crescent shape. And what happens is if you load it, it develops hoop stresses to resist the, the, um, the loads. So it actually has collagen fibers that run around its circumference to, to carry out this role. Um, it, it has similar composition, water and collagen and proteoglycan, although the proportions are a little bit different. And although they're similar in composition, they're very different in uh, terms of how you can image them because the, the T2 relaxation time of cartilage is about 30 to 40 milliseconds, where of meniscus is like eight to 12. So we kind of run into the, the short T2 tissue realm with the meniscus. So these are kind of two important tissues in loading our knees. Um, and the, the, this is their composition. So why am I telling you about this? Well, when we load t materials that have two phases like this, a solid phase and a, and, um, a liquid phase, we run into the issue of viscoelasticity. So we have multiple phases uh, with the water distributing and then our, our um, solid phase behaving more elastic. As a result, we have a time varying response to load. So if we use articular cartilage as an example, so that's just the, the tissue here that we were talking about. At the big, if I, and I'm just gonna use um, a, a model of applying a displacement. So just a constant displacement to the top of the tissue with a load and then holding that displacement. And what happens is you get stress relaxation behavior. And this is um, a model uh, proposed by uh, Mao and, and in the early 80s, and it, it's still very relevant today, where you have this idea that when your cartilage is unloaded, kind of more equally, the water is equally distributed throughout it. But actually, as you load it, the reason we get the, we see this, this stress relaxation behavior is we get a disproportionate kind of movement of water across the tissue um, until we finally reach equilibrium. And so this is our viscoelastic behavior. So as you can imagine, if we're trying to image this phenomenon, it's not easy because this happens on the order of minutes, not seconds, right? So, it, and even tens of minutes, as I'll show you later. So we have this problem of how do we image under load with a viscoelastic material? Um, there's two, the approach I just talked about was this stress relaxation. So if I apply a constant displacement or strain, I can then measure the, the the curve here. I can, or I know the behavior will be along some type of. Um, Sorry, does someone has to ask a question there?
Sorry, someone just said something is, can everyone hear me okay? I'm assuming everyone can hear me okay. I'm sorry, I can't, oh, there's something in the chat here. Okay, great, great, thank you. Yeah, so I'll continue here. Um, so our stress relaxation behavior is gonna behave somewhere between our solid and fluid-like, but we but that's one way to do it. So we could apply a, a constant displacement to our tissue. But if we look at creep testing, so applying a constant load or stress, remember stress is this forced over area, right? Look at our material, we get a, a lit, we're gonna end up with um, reaching an equilibrium a bit faster than our stress relaxation. But unfortunately, a, a creep rig is more difficult. So I'll talk to you a little bit next about um, how we address that. So we generally call our, our, our creep testing load controlled rigs and our stress relaxation testing displacement controlled rigs. So I'm going to use that terminology in the next section. Okay, so we've done the first part. So why image the loaded knee? Well, I hope that I've, I've kind of explained to you a bit about we want to image it in a functional way and some of the challenges associated in, with imaging in the in the loaded knee. So how did how do we address this in our group? This is our first generation displacement controlled rig. So I'll just take a second to orient you to this rig. This is a cadaver knee in the middle. And we, it's, it's obviously we've covered it so people don't need to see it. We use an absorbent wrapper and this is all contained in a, in a plastic tube. So, um, so it's not dripping on the MRI, <laughs> but the whole thing goes into the MRI basically. And how we, we align it and we pot the bones in dental stone, but we keep all the tissues on the knee in this middle zone here. Now in this particular rig, so we've got the knee and then we've got these ends where we've got dental stone inside these PVC kind of tubes. We have an MRI safe loading load cell that will measure the amount of load that we apply that we put down the end here. And then at the top, we have these two plates. Um, one sits close to the knee itself and then there's some space and then the top place that st stays on the outside of the tube. And we strap all that together so that it's holding nice and firm together. And then we insert these threaded rods. And then we've got these nuts on these rods. So we tighten the nuts down. And then what happens is it just applies a constant displacement as we push this plate into the knee. And we just get a wrench in there and we tighten these nuts up as much as we can. And we can actually get to about 100% body weight load. Um, but it's just in the axial direction. Um, and it's displacement controlled. So we have that stress relaxation behavior, which means we need to wait if to image quite, a, we need to wait quite a while if we wanna image in equilibrium. And I'll show you some data on what that looks like in a little bit. So when I first got here, I knew this was the easier rig to build. So we built the displacement control cadaver rig first. Um, and I actually had a couple undergrad USRAs build this and, and get it working. So, um, but I knew that we would really want the load controlled rig and probably more um, a, a more complex loading scenario, more similar to what we experienced during normal activities like walking or gait, stick, rising from a chair, just our normal things. Because those are three dimensional loads where we have you know, forces and moments in all three planes. So what we did, what I did is I had a student work on this second generation of, of, of uh, rig. So it's a load controlled rig. And how we achieve this is we actually have an air compressor in the control room. And then we have all these gauges to supply different um, um, kind of amounts of pressure, air pressure to our loading rig. So to orient you to this rig, we have our specimen, our cadaver specimen potted in here. And then we do apply, or we have it in, we have our load cell again. So in a strain box to measure the load there. We have an axial load that we apply um, with one of the, the the air, like the pneumatic 
um, pistons. And then we also have a um, an, our, our theta positioning stage so that we can move that and apply the moment. We also have um, lines coming that are attached to the muscles in the cadaver knee that we apply tension to. So we have these tensile pistons pulling on the muscles. So we're trying to load the joint. Instead of just squishing the joint in the last rig, we are applying a physiologic axial load, but also pulling on the muscles because that's how our knees work, right? We work by engaging our, our muscles and that's what loads our knee. So we are trying to facilitate like to, to mimic that three-dimensional loading scenario with our axial loads, our moments, and our muscles. And so we know what resultant loads we want in the knee, and then we apply the appropriate um, pressures through our, our hoses to our different pistons to apply these loads. So we're we are we've tested this um, in the lab so far, and this we're going to be using it in the MRI really soon um, the, in the next kind of few months. So it's really exciting, but it's been a five year process designing and constructing this rig because it's we can't use metal, right? So, well, I mean, we have a little bit of metal here, but it's it, basically the only metal we have um, is on some of the pins atta um, attaching the, to the muscles, but otherwise it's all made of plastic. All right, so next I'm gonna talk about our in vivo rigs, so our living human rigs. So this is our first generation um, rig and our in vivo rigs are all load controlled because the person is just is pushing against some force. So that's more most in vivo like rigs that people use, living people use tend to be load control. Um, but the problem is we end up applying kind of smaller loads. So as whereas our cadaver ones were up at like full body, like 100% body weight, which is like standing on one foot. This one we can apply all kinds of all kinds of we get really high loads in this one. With the hum in the in vivo ones, we're down at the 20 or 30, and this is kind of what you'd experience like um, when you're walking when you swing your leg through. That's the type of loads, and it's just purely because when you're lying on your back, it's hard to apply high loads in that position now this rig that the, you're it's kind of like um think of it as a, a gym, piece of gym equipment where you know you, you say push push a weight away from you so um you have we here we have our pedal and then at the back here we have a series of bungee cords so we can um moderate the amount of load we apply depending on the size and um weight of the person and they basically just push on it and and we acquire image while they're pushing on the pedal um because these loads are quite low we wanted to try to do something to get up to 50 percent body weight which is equivalent to standing up on both legs we figured that should, we figured that should be possible lying down and what we've done well, here is we've created this new rig where we can't get the 50 percent and it's really because recently these um composite springs with high fit stiffness have come on the market and so we can create um a rig with with just like with a series of um springs in parallel to get up to these loads and we've made it interchangeable so people of different weights can um, we just switch the spring, string springs in and out to have a nice um um, percentage body weight load for each individual. So this is an example of them lying in the scanner, their knees at the ISIS center, and then we've got this rig in here. That, um, there's We have a backboard to it as well and uh, some handles for the, the participants to hold on to while they press on it. But we're getting some really nice results with this. So the accuracy of our six spring con um, configuration, we're getting kind of um, fits of, of close to one. And then we did a re repeatability study and we're getting RMS CVs of about 12%, which for biomechanics, we're happy with that. That's around the 10% is pretty good. And you can imagine if you came back and tried to push to the same amount on another day, it's quite hard to get back to that level. And, and even holding within an exam, you can imagine is tricky. 
but we do that what we have is on the top of the rig it's not oh, okay part of it's kind of shown here we have um this visual cue so the patient can look down the bore and we have kind of a um a line this isn't shown on here there's like a separate piece where they have to match the top of this uh it's basically a gear system, it's a gear rack. So it pushes up and you match the height of the lines and you, you try and hold those lines matching. And that means that you're holding the load at a particular position. So with that visual cue, um, we can, can get to kind of the 10% um, uh, repeatability on the loads, which is fine for what we're doing in terms of wanting to apply approximately a 50% body weight load. Um, yeah, it ends up being a few a few kilograms kind of kind of thing in air. Are there any questions about the rigs? I know it's it's I'm, I don't see any video, so I don't, I don't have a sense of what's going on with the um, audience right now. But does anyone have any questions about rigs before I move on to the MR sequences? This might be your you know where people have more interest, so that's fine too. I know the rig thing is probably different for this crowd. <laughs> Okay, hearing none, I'll, I'll keep going. So now I'm gonna just dive into some of the MRI sequences and image processing techniques we use in our group in order to um, image our knees. So our newest sequence is called Fuse. Um, you can find the, I think I didn't even put a, the link to the publication. It is, it is published. If you look for Fuse in my name, you'll see, you'll find the paper and um, it's, it was a, it's, taken a long time to get to that point with the great help of my collaborators, um, PhD student Lu Meng Chui, who, who now works at Siemens, um, and then Naranjan Benugopal, who used to be at cancer, or used to work at, at um, Sask Cancer, but moved to Cancer Care Manitoba. And then uh, Dr. Jerry Moran, who works at Siemens, who probably a lot of you know quite well. <laughs> um, so, our team, we developed this flexible ultra short echo time sequence. Um, and the idea was that we wanted to have both radial and spiral trajectories, as well as in 2D and in 3D. So we have the Koosh ball style as well and our, our cones. And our idea behind this was um, most sites have one UTE research sequence or one UTE sequence, which is either radial or spiral. I mean, some of the, obviously some of the top places have multiple, but we wanted to have all of that in one place so that we could optimize our sequence for the applications. Like, do you want a 2D radial for your for the knees or should it be 3D cones, right? We, we didn't know the answers to those questions and it's really hard to do a back-to-back -to, -back to comparison and optimize what we should be using if we don't have a single sequence that does all of that. So that was the idea initially behind like, why do we wanna do this? Is to have everything in one place so we can really do the best job possible of UTE of our knees. I, again, I mentioned briefly that um, the meniscus was a shorter T2 tissue. In the knee, we also have bone, which is short. Um, tendons and ligaments are short T2. All of those tissues that are important in knee function, um, they are sh short T2 tissues and so need some a UTE sequence to really um, image them properly. Um, we have a choice of RF pulses, half sync and verse, and, and in 3D, a hard rectangular. Um, like I said, we have our different trajectories. And then we also added some long um, T2 suppression techniques, so we can do just a dual echo subtraction, a water saturation, a fat saturation, and we also have off an off residence pulse, which you can use to do UTE QMT. So um, we, we really tried to add a lot of things in here. We have um, inline uh, um, off residence artifact correction. We developed, um, we implemented some ones that are already in the literature. Um, in most cases, but in our 3D case, we actually do have a, a new method um, that's working really nicely to do that off-residence correction in 3D. 
So that's our sequence. And I'm just going to show you some of the images from it. Um, this is a, a knee again. So I've got an axial view, a coronal view, a sagittal view. And then um, I also have some meniscus images to show at the bottom. Um, this is a bovine knee, so a cow's knee. And that's why it looks a little different. It made me laugh a little bit because so my student was on a um, Lumen who did this work was on a, a my tax in, in Toronto during basically during COVID. And I, I was able to collect data at uh, at six sick kids actually for this project. But we realized that it probably wouldn't be possible to be shipping um, the human cadavers across the country and finding places to store them during COVID. It was just very difficult. So we're like, oh, we'll just use the bovine ones. And I tried to find somewhere in Ontario to buy a bovine knee to, to do this work. And it was impossible. Whereas here in Saskatoon, I can drive 20 minutes down the road and buy a, a bovine knee for 25 bucks from the, from the abattoir. So that's, I guess, a pro of living somewhere like this. Um, so back to the image here, um, we have our, our knees across the top and this is just demonstrating the different types of contrast we can get with fuse. So here's like a, a, a long TE subtraction, or sorry, this our long TE image, our short TE image, and then our, our dual echo subtraction. Um, then we did some rescaling um, and, and we kind of did some other image math. I like to call these ones image math to kind of highlight different features. But you see, you really start to see the cortical bone nicely. Our tendon is so nice and bright in these images as we go from kind of our, you know, UTE images that have so much signal that it's hard to kind of see one thing from another. We start doing some image math to, to get the, the contrast we'd like from the different tissues. We have our fat saturations working really nicely. We have some empty contrast here, subtraction and uh, ratios. And then looking into the meniscus, which is, you know, uh, we do a lot of work on this in our group. And so that's why it shows up. But again, we're getting nice signal and nice morphology from our meniscus across these different contrasts. We also do some T2 star mapping and we've done, and this is again, is a, a meniscus. We've done the mono exponential fitting and bi exponential fitting um, um, with a, a bunch of different echo times. And we're seeing really reasonable results. They're all a bit lower for the bovine than for human. So if you're seeing like, oh, these seem a bit off that, that's why the bovine meniscus, the, the, the T2 is a bit different. Um, yeah, so, so this is kind of proof of concept that our fuse sequence is working and we're able to do our quantitative mapping with it. Um, I also wanted to just highlight my uh, colleague, Naranjan Venagopal. Um, he's very interested in synthetic CT. So this kind of shows from our, our um, from fuse from our short echo time and a longer suppression one that we can get a nice subtraction image and see um, high bone contrast. This is just um, a skull that like a dried skull though, like, and I think, yeah, we must've put it, we put it in saline to image, no. Did we put it in saline? I'm gonna have to remember that one. It was a while ago. Uh, no, yeah, it must not because the signal's not blowing out. Yeah, so we sorry, it's just it's just a skull that we imaged. Um, that was from, um, I think, yeah, from Manitoba. Um, we also did a CT on it and did a registration, and you can see we have really nice comparisons between the CT and the, the fuse difference image or subtraction image, getting nice detail of the cortical bone and the trabecular bone, and have some pretty good registration. Um, some differences, but yeah, so we're, we're happy with how this work is progressing in terms of Fuse's ability to do some synthetic CT work. I'll quickly talk about the other sequences that I've been using in the group. Um, these were ones I worked on when I was at Stanford. Um, QDES is um, a bit different than the DES you might be familiar with on Siemens. So Siemens has a DES sequence that has um, two echoes before and after this effective, like this gradient. But what they do is they do the sum of squares. Well, we think the sum of squares of these two echoes, and that's what the is spit out on the scanner. Whereas in this, we keep these separate and we 
Um, we also sometimes run it twice with different spoilers. And then we can do uh, T1, T2, and ADC mapping. Um, if we do two different spoilers or if we keep, stick with one, we can get a T2 map. And we have both um, like a, a lookup table approach to do that as well as an analytical approach to get T2. Um, so this is, yeah, this is one of the sequences that we use. I also use uh, a multi-echo version of DES for meniscus so because because um, DES, it works well for cartilage, but it's got a longer TR. So we were trying to find another way to get some quantitative mapping of the meniscus with DES. So we came up with this multi-echo DES sequence. Um, it's quite similar. Uh, except we 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 have an effective spoiler between them, but not an actual spoiler. And we run two echoes before and after this effective spoiler. And then what we do is we actually have interleaving TRs, um, where the the TE one and TE two are offset by a little bit. But basically, what ends up happening is like this TE one ends up being the same time as from echo eight to the next RF pulse. So you can imagine that, um, but, but basically we end up with four symmetric, or eight echoes symmetric about uh, an effective gradient before, yeah, before and after it. So um, because once you get all the data, these signals are interleaved with each other. Yeah. So we can use it to do T2 and T2 star mapping. Um, how we do that is, I'll show you the analytical approach. So if we, we end up with these shorter echo times, our TEs are quite short, all below 10. For the T2, we can use this equation um, to um, yeah, calculate the T2. I should have said before, the reason we can do this is the echoes before the gradient are a mixture of T1 and T2 contrast, and the ones that are after the, the gradient are a mixture of T2 and diffusion contrast. And um, we can then use our, I think we used EPGs to, to uh, understand the signal and came up with this equation that works nicely for our T2. Um, for T2 star, we can obviously just take the first four echoes and do a mono exponential fit to it. Um, and get our T2 star mapping. Um, and these are just some examples of what our DES, QDES images um, look like, our quantitative maps. And this is femoral cartilage, so at the end of your thigh bone, and then again, meniscus, so our, our tissue of interest, our T2 and T2 star from, from uh, MEDES. All right. Okay, so I just wanted to quickly mention um, the image analysis approaches that we use. Um, osteoarthritis, in, in osteoarthritis, articular cartilage tends to degenerate in a focal way and, and not necessarily across the entire surface. But often we, in the literature, you'll see people who just like take the average T2 of the whole tissue. Now, my thoughts on that is like, well, you could be missing, you could be drowning out or obscuring some really important focal hot spots if you do your analysis that way. So while we do do like an averaged anal analysis, we call it a regional analysis because we'll pick kind of compartments and just average the T2 in that area. We also wanted an approach that like highlighted focal hot spots in the tissue. Um, and we do this with changes over time and also changes with load. So obviously in this presentation, I'll focus on the changes with load. So what we do is we take our T2 map, we segment our cartilage and we create projection maps. So think of unwrapping your, your femur, your head to your thigh bone um, just onto a flat surface, kind of like a globe can be a flat map. Um, and then for the tibia or the, the shin bone surface, we just project along a, a plane so we end up with those projection maps for the, the different, for the unloaded and loaded, I'll use the example of, and then we do a subtraction. And with that subtraction, we um, then set a threshold for, for like cluster, we call it cluster size and cluster amount. So um, like change. So it's usually 10 milliseconds, quite a big change because we're quite conservative with this. And then we identify these areas that of high change 
in the tissue. So like how like from the unloaded to the loaded position where the biggest change happens. Um, and we do this for like positive changes and negative changes. So increases in T2 and decreases in T2. So that's kind of the cluster approach. When I, when I say cluster approach, that's what I mean. And that's what we're doing in our group. The other thing we've been trying in the meniscus, because the meniscus does not really de degenerate in a focal way. It's more a general way. But we we found that maybe we were missing some elements of the of the change. And so we tried we decided to try the the a texture analysis. So we used a grade level co-occurrence co matrix or GLCM approach and did our 18 texture parameters. I'm, I'm sure if anyone who's done a texture analysis would be very familiar with Herlix measures. But basically, if you if you haven't, if you're not familiar with it, you you take your your you resolve your matrix into you know bins and i've just got from zero to two here and then you start looking at the difference along the diff different directions so um along here we've got zero zero how many zero to zeros along this line well we've got two right and then same thing at the 90 degree we've got a zero zero we've got a one and then in the kind of the up and down or I guess I should have called this zero and 90, but you know, you get what I'm saying here. We've got one of those, so it goes in there. Then you make this GLCM matrix, and then you look at the texture statistics. Um, and we, I'll show you some results of that in a second, but it's another way to kind of understand how the internal structures changing, because we know those are related back to our composition, right? Like how are those inner structures changing? So that's why we're trying out some texture analysis. All right, so now I'm going to finish off by just talking about some results um, in these are in healthy knees and um, cadaver knees. Uh, we basically were not able to do any scanning between the start of the pandemic and June 2023. So we were off the scanner for over three years here. So it's been a tough go to get data but this was these data were collected before the pandemic and we've just had to make do with processing them so that's kind of where we're at but we found some really interesting relationships between them so i just wanted to share them with you today so this is this student this is natasha zowie's work and she did uh used our displacement controlled ex vivo loading rig to look at focal changes so our clusters and we, she looked inside and outside of regions of cartilage contact. So where the cartilage touches each other in the knee joint and the tibiofemoral joint, so between your thigh bone and your shin bone. Um, we had six cadaver specimens. They're quite old, which is quite common, but they were relatively healthy. Um, we used our QDES sequence, like I said, because we're looking at cartilage here and with our, um, parameters that are uh, generally sim similar to the work that's been done. Um, and then we applied our, and, our 800 Newton nodes load, which is about one body weight. And we actually waited 110 minutes between our unloaded and loaded scans to uh, um, account for the stress relaxation I was talking about earlier. And what we did to, to understand that was we acquired a coronal image at 10 minute intervals throughout that period of waiting. And we subtracted that current time point from the previous one to see if there was any structure. If we saw any structure, that means that there was movement between the time points. So you'll see as we waited and waited, you see less structure. And so um, that means that there's less and less motion. We're approaching equilibrium. At 100 minutes, we were pretty close. We can't see anything in the cartilage. And honestly, it's really painful when you know you're paying you know, 500 bucks an hour to be scanning nothing. You're just waiting. So we, we kind of landed on about 110 minutes was a good place to start scanning again. Um, ideally, this would just, this last image would just look like noise, but um, we were comfortable kind of going at this point. We're pretty close to equilibrium. Um, so the contact, this is our, our our difference map. So loaded projection map minus unloaded. Um, and then we also draw the contact area on it. So where the cartilage of the femur is touching the cartilage of the tibia. Um, and then we, we define clusters based on area threshold and intensity threshold. And we found really neat results where the decrease 
is really within our most of decreased clusters are within our contact area and that aligns with what others have shown the decrease in t2 with load but then we find these really interesting increases kind of adjacent to them probably representing the increased water in those areas so the water moving throughout the tissue so no one's really shown kind of what how water moves throughout the tissue with degeneration force so this is a pretty neat finding and you see that quite clearly with our femoral and tibial um, the clusters this is the percent clusters inside the contact area and outside so um, we end up with big decrease in clusters inside our contact areas and then some outside as well a smaller number outside yeah now this is our in vivo study we did a repeatability study so we scanned five people on three days loaded and unloaded and we used the same approach a regional approach in a, in a um, cluster approach so they used our first generation loading rig um, and this is an example of the the regional versus cluster and what we found in this study is we found really good repeatability for our um, unloaded over over time Sorry, our region. Sorry, this is our regional. The results for our regional really good repeatability on both loaded and unloaded, and this is aligned with the literature. This three millisecond repeatability over um, over time is 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 good. Now, when we started doing the focal assessment, we found better repeatability over time than when load, and this is expected because I'm not convinced that you can load your knee in the exact same way every time and that the water would go to the exact same place every time. So it's actually showing a really neat phenomenon of our unloaded scans were really, the clusters were repeatable over, over time, but our loaded ones were not. So we're getting a neat story there with that. And then if you look at the difference between our two studies, so our ex vivo study, which we have these really clear clusters inside our contact areas and outside our contact areas whereas our in vivo study didn't show that this is another neat finding but it's really because going back to when we're imaging in the loading cycle so the in vivo we're imaging right away we're kind of up on this curve here right we're we're, we're trying to we're trying to uh, image kind of really quickly whereas later this is where we're at for the cadaver so it's not really surprising that our clusters look pretty different as the water redistributes throughout the tissue um i also just wanted to show some data from the meniscus because we in in the cadaver study i just showed you we have also done the texture analysis in the meniscus and done the regional analysis with that as well so this is just denoting the that cadaver loading rig um, we have T2 relaxation time or T2 star relaxation time on our um, Y axis and then along the X we have the full meniscus, the medial side of the meniscus and the lateral side of the meniscus and um, our loaded knees are in um, orange and are, are unloaded in blue and we're really seeing that pattern of decrease in T2 and to a bit of a lesser, lesser extent T2 star in the loaded knee which is as expected. Our texture analysis reveals a lot of change, like uh, shows a lot of differences between the loaded and unloaded menisci for both T2 and T2 star. T2 star showed fewer. Um, so I don't, we're gonna have to detangle that a bit to see what these, I mean, cause the texture parameters, it's hard to, to think about some of them in terms of what they mean physically, um, but we'll have to start detangling that. But there is some promise here to say that texture analysis does show changes with load, which is nice. All right, I just want to finish off by saying, uh, pointing to some work that uh, your, your colleague Eve and I have been working on for a very long time. <laughs> and, um, but it, it's probably a topic that many of you are familiar with because I know a lot of QMT has been done at, um, at McGill. So we were doing a project of QMT in the meniscus because there has, still hasn't, we're still I think the only ones trying this, no one else really has tried it in the meniscus in this way. Um, we wanted to really validate QMT in the meniscus, so we took cadaver knees, took tissues, we did mechanical testing on the tissues, biochemistry and histology, um, and then um, and then we did correlations to compare them. Um, I won't belabor this slide because I think a lot of you know about QMT there, but it basically is another quantitative metric where 
Um, we can learn things about the free pool, so your water um, based on saturating the bound pool like your collagens and then having the, ex the magnetization exchange between the pools, we can image that. And if we do this a bunch of times over and over again, we can obviously get do some mapping and we get these five parameters out of our maps. I mean, that's I've oversimplified this and there's lots going on here. So <laughs> bear with me on that, but um, general idea there. Um, we do see correlations between some of our um, QMT parameters and our, our, um, co our composition of the tissues and our histology. So that's really exciting. The thing about the, this work though, is that we use the healthy cadaver knees and we're really kind of only sampling part of the curve. We need to then now look at more um, degenerated tissues to, under, to get a full picture of what those correlations are. Cause yeah, I can imagine that there'll be a lot of differences that in, in the degenerated tissues. Okay, so this is, I, I think I've somewhat kept to time here. And um, so just to recap, we talked about why we want to image in the loaded knee, the type of loading rigs that our group's been using to try and do this, some of the MR sequences that we use in our group and the analysis approaches, as well as some, some of the results we've been getting and why they kind of really are starting to show some interesting stories. So the take home message is that when you're imaging in a loaded joint, you really need to consider viscoelasticity when designing your rigs and acquiring your images. Um, paying attention to that time course and where you are on that time course. Um, and also that we are seeing these cluster patterns from our quantitative MR work. Um, and but this this time dependence of the loading is really changing what we see. So we have to keep that in mind as we do it. So I'll just end off by thanking the funding sources, my current group members, and I'll take any questions now. Great. There uh, we go. Super, thank you very much. Very interesting talk. I just wanted to make a note for the audience that the University of Saskatchewan has a uh, has its place in medical physics history as well. It's the oh, university Sylvia that Sylvia Fedorak. Fedorak. Yeah, we have a Sylvia Fedorak drive here. And there's a Sylvia Fedorak display at the Western Development Museum. So all the kids know Sylvia Fedorak. <laughs> He's one of the pioneers of uh, radiotherapy. Yeah, C, C, C60, right? Yeah. Uh, questions for Dr. McWalter, Jorge. You can come up, sure. Yeah, then I can see you. <laughs> hey, hello, Dr. McWaters. Thank Water. you so much for, the, so presentation. Much for the presentation. I was wondering, I was... Uh, given that FUSE is some sort of a single stop for many UT imaging techniques, uh, I wonder if you had the chance to try many, try many things. Did you find some sort of approach that is optimal and trajectory that is better for knee imaging or for joint imaging? Yeah, we're going with the 3D cones for the knee, which is a lot of the, like there's definitely one other group who's also chosen that. Um, but we are finding that 3D cones is working nicest. It's a nice trade-off between time and um, resolution and and artif artifact reduction so that's the one we're liking right now but there we're finding it so application dependent so for our first go at it for right now it's static knees we've got we've just been doing our first human knees with fuse in the last few months we're finding that one's the best um we have I, we I don't we haven't done one in the with the loading rig yet so I'm interested to see I still think it should be the one that works the best um but but uh I keep an open mind I'm going to do an application kind of, uh, uh, each application will probably re-optimize yeah but great question and if we imagine like a competition between UT imaging and traditional multi-echo imaging or interleaf echo imaging uh, do you think there is a still a place for traditional multi-echo imaging or the way to go is UT? Absolutely, because, um, you know, so access to UTE is pretty low. Like if you're, if you're not at a research site, 
your your access is limited. And for example, we have Petra on the scanner here, but the techs won't use it because they don't understand it and they don't know how to optimize it. The parameters aren't optimized for the different applications. So I, I feel like the like just Cartesian T2 gets you gets you what you need for cartilage for sure. The the even the T2 star mapping on on the like conventional T2 star mapping on the scanner, you can do meniscus for sure. So there's absolutely a place, especially if we want to um, do bigger studies with really robust sequences. I, I I'm a huge believer in like that we we can experiment with our new whiz bang tech whiz bang techniques in our community but keep it also focusing we need robust techniques for the general community to use in their studies makes sense and maybe the last one sorry for taking so much time but out of the blue is there any value of doing quantitative mri in the muscles surrounding the knee maybe for the diagnostic of some like details about this type of diseases Absolutely. So um, there was one study while well, I was at Stanford, someone had, you know, did a T2 map of muscle and then had the people do like heel raises to work their muscle and then scan them again. And obviously you see a change because the blood flow changes in the muscle. Um, I think finding a use for that is um, you'd want to you want to think carefully about what the use for that is. I will point to a study that was done at McGill, though. I, I, some of you must be familiar with the the CHR CSA bed rest study, the head down two week bed rest study that was done at McGill last couple of years. I we there's a bone health group here that did a bunch of bone imaging on them, but we also did ideal um, muscle imaging to get fat fraction to look at the fat infiltration in muscles as a result of like before and after bed rest. So I feel like we, you, when you look at your quantitative metric, you need to link it to a physiologic phenomenon that you want to study. So this group, for example, knows that fat infiltration leads to muscle weakness. So we're like, okay, well, let's measure that. So we didn't choose to do T2 there. We chose to do ideal to look at fat fraction, right? So, so quantitative MRI definitely has its place, but we need to be mindful of using it in appropriate ways. Okay, thank you so much. Great. Uh, any other questions for Dr. McWalker? Jules, another one in the room. It's good that I was here today. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. Uh, really enjoyed it. Um, but I have a question about the design of Fuse. So if I understand correctly, let's say you, you want to use spirals and you have the options to have a 2D spiral or a 3D spiral. And going from 2D to 3D, you start using cones. So I was wondering why not use something like a stack of spirals and then uh, I guess the programming would be easier on your yeah, side. I think I'd have to double check with Lu Meng, but I feel like we like you can do a stack of spirals like with the 2D, right? Like do a series of the like that ends up being a, a stack of spirals. I, I, I guess he didn't program the 3D version of that, um, but we're still like this is a work in progress, right? Like I have a student here. We're adding the multi echo right now, so maybe that is something we should consider is adding that stack of spirals. I'd have to look back at his thesis to see if there's a reason he said he didn't want to add it, <laughs> why he chose the cones at the time. But yeah, I mean, I, I see this as like a work in progress sequence where we want to keep improving it and add like. I'm in the knee, there is research that uses stack of spirals really effectively. So I can see it definitely going in that direction for sure. Okay. Um, another question. So I myself work with uh, with spirals for UTE. And one of my big, big concerns is, uh, is to keep the scan time as low as possible. And I was looking at the resolutions of your images and I was getting kind of jealous there. And I was wondering <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of scan times are you? Do you need for those? Um, yeah, I think the the nicest ones are 12 minutes. And we're kind of doing, we're operating about the five to six minute mark right now. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the thing is when they're cadavers, we don't, we can do the longer ones, right? Like the, that that's the thing. Like I put up my eye candy images that are cadavers because I don't get motion artifact with them. They're generally pretty still. 
So, <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean, I'm going to show my best images, but yeah, absolutely that, that the times end up being long, but especially when we're imaging and load, we need to keep it to that five minute mark. Our images aren't going to look like that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank they you. They are beautiful, but they're beautiful. <laughs> 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 Great. Maybe one more question if there is. Anyone online? If you type it into the chat, I can read it too. No. Okay, with that, I'd like to thank Dr. McWalter again and thank you all for uh, being here today. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. It was fun. <laughs> pleasure. Pleasure. It's nice to get questions like this. I don't I don't normally like no one knows about MRI here. <laughs> I, I have to teach MRI to the um, the residents, like the medical imaging residents. I teach it in like a fourth year health sciences imaging course. I teach it to the engineers. It's just like I'm the I'm the person who has to do it. So you can, it's, you uh, can blame uh, blame Eve for that. He he keeps on shoving MRI down our throats, and you know, but it's the best it's modality. <laughs> Um, I was I was gonna say though my if if you're looking for other modalities my my <laughs> my husband does, is also a prof here and he does ultrasound with micro bubbles it might be an interesting talk for your group as well. We're always looking for good speakers. So, well, Eve can say is he a good speaker? I, I <laughs> well, thanks a lot. All right.